All right, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Souter. Um, welcome to all you smiling faces and all you at home. Good to have you all with us. One of the great things about having kids is the way it sparks memories of our own childhood. At least it does for me. I don't have a very good memory. But when I see my kids doing certain things, different memories come back to mind. My kids are way easier to parent than I was, by the way. I was, I was a bit of a punk, or a wannabe punk anyway. When I was 13, I was big into skateboarding. Only problem is we lived on a farm in the middle of the mountains, so the only asphalt was the road in front of our house. So we would skate there, and we'd set up our ramp in the road, and then when a car or log truck or milk truck would come by, we'd quick move it off and then move it back on. Well, after a year or so of that, I convinced my dad to build us a half pipe, a ramp in our barn. So on Thanksgiving weekend, my dad and my friends and a few other guys got together and we built this, this awesome half pipe in our barn, took up half the barn. I'm still not sure how my dad agreed to such a thing, but Anyway, we got all the framing done, we got the platforms built, we got the uh, grind rail at the top, we got the first layer of plywood on, half inch plywood. It had to be thin so you can bend it to the ramp. It was the, it was the most beautiful thing a 14 year old kid in the country had ever seen. So we finished the ramp late that day and my dad was really clear he was like all right listen don't get on the ramp until tomorrow once we can put the second layer on and my friends and I are like okay okay all right sure well <laughs> late that night I'm 14 right so late that night after a few too many skate videos and Mountain Dews my friends and I couldn't take it any longer and we were soon out in the barn riding that half-inch plywood ramp like we were in California. We thought we were so cool until it happened, as you could guess. It's probably a good thing it was me. I got hooked up kind of on the skateboard. I was doing a trick at the top, and I fell from the top of the ramp all the way to the bottom and put my shoulder through the plywood. I'm sure it's on an old VHS video somewhere. So the next morning we get out there with my dad and um, my dad just kind of looks at me and kind of looks over his glasses at me like he used to do. I'm sure I tried to blame it on a cow or something, but unfortunately that was the first of many fails over the next six or seven years of my life. I was a, an impatient person, you might say. I just couldn't wait. Putting my shoulder through a piece of plywood was the least of my troubles. But for the grace, the patience of God, the patience of my dad, God only knows where I'd be today. I, I would not be standing here, I can tell you that. We are in a nine-week sermon series looking at the nine fruits of the Spirit that the Apostle Paul referred to in his letter to the Galatians. You can look, look it up in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. We can't produce these things on our own. We can only do this stuff with the help of God working in us. These are things that are evidence that God's actually alive in our lives. No, now, I want to give you a quick trick if you want to memorize these. The first three are one syllable, love, joy, peace. The second are two syllable, love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness. And the third are three syllables, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Gentleness, <laughs> faithfulness, self-control. At least that's how it works in the NIV. Well, the NIV has uh, forbearance, but patience is basically the same thing. So there are nine distinct fruits of the Spirit, but you can't have one without the other, 
Real love is not seen without kindness. Joy is not available without self-control. You'll never find true peace, shalom, without patience. These are things the whole world is looking for, like gold. Especially the first three, love, joy, peace, especially now. So today we remember the lesser appreciated but ever so important fruit of patience. I don't know if we've ever had a sermon on patience. I, I, I love Heather King's description of patience. Patience is not insisting on what I perceive is right or what I am due at the moment I want it. That's what, that was said in the testimony before the service. Not insisting on what I perceive is right or what I am due at the moment I want it. Woo. Patience. We know we should have it. We know when we lose it. Most of us probably want more of it. Why do we struggle so hard with patience? Well, there's a couple reasons. For one, we struggle with patience because of technology. I, I just, wherever possible, blame it on some inanimate thing like technology, okay? Since the 1960s, Moore's Law, founded by Intel co-founder Gordon Moore, Moore's Law has almost kept its promise that every 12 months, a silicon chip should be able to double its storage capacity. Well, thanks to that, the phones in your pocket have more than 100,000 times the processing power and more than a million times the storage capacity of the Apollo 2, the spacecraft that landed people on the moon in 1969. 100,000 times the speed. That's an iPhone. Okay, I don't know about an Android. It's probably at least 100 times faster, but. <laughs> I said that in the first service and people booed at me. And I thought, you know what? I wish we could just go back to fighting about stuff like that, but. We struggle. The, the point is, this technology stuff, it changes the way we think. Particularly, it changes the way we think about time. We struggle with patience because progress has this way of luring us into impatience. Progress lures us into thinking everything should be faster, easier, better with every year or every model. I heard, a, I heard this awful ad on the radio the other day. I should call the, the auto dealership up. And they were like, um, if you're it was a woman's voice and she was like, if you're tired of the model you have, you should come and get this new model. I was like, this is just weird on every level. <laughs> but that's the kind of culture we live in. You're tired of it? Exchange it. You don't like it? Get rid of it. Doesn't matter if it's worn out, just get rid of it. Second, patience gets harder when we're worried, we're afraid, we're under stress. It's one thing to wait at a red light when you're on your way home from work and you're relaxed and you're listening to music, it's another thing to wait at the same red light with your three-year-old bleeding from a head wound and you're trying to hold their head as you drive. That's happened to me before. You, you wait a little lift or you don't wait at the light, you know? Stress, fear, worry, they massively impact our ability to be patient. Enter covid 19, right? Is it any wonder we're losing, we, myself included, is it any wonder we're losing our minds and losing our patience? The stress this thing has caused in our homes, in our work, in the church, it's just, it's huge. And Christians are not exempt from stress or fear. We just have the antidote to it. So third, the most and most significantly, the main reason I think we are impatient is because we miss the big picture. We forget that there is a very real, very present God in control, so to speak, 
and we are not that God. We're frustrated, we're angry with our kids or our spouses or our parents, our coworkers. We're angry with our country because we're impatient. We're impatient because we're stressed. We're stressed because we're afraid and we're afraid because we forget about God. We forget as Christians, regardless of our age, that God has proven he's the only one who can take care of us. He's the only steady, good, perfectly good thing there is. And most of our patience comes from forgetting that. So what are we, what are we supposed to do? Well, we can work at it. Like a discipline, we can work to develop patience. Most of us know if you pray for patience, God will give you ample chances to grow in patience. But the only way to really grow faster, if I can use that idea, the way to really grow faster in patience is to either discover or rediscover the patient God and to see ourselves the way he sees us, to see other people and situations the way he sees other people. He recalibrates time for us. He's slow to anger. He's willing to suffer. He's, he's, his purpose in all of that is to save people. Let's look at those each a little bit. First of all, he is slow to anger. God is slow to anger. For the Jewish people, the patience of God was most commonly seen in his willingness to reserve or restrict his anger. A brief description of God used over and over in the scriptures goes like this. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. That's that's how the psalmist described God in Psalm 86, Psalm 103, Psalm 145. That's his character. The prophets repeated it. The prophet Joel said, Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Nahum, the prophet Nahum said, The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. We can think of slow and patient as weak. Nahum's saying that's not it at all. He's slow to anger, but great in, in power. Jonah was so angry, so hateful of the people of Nineveh, he complained about it to God. He used this statement about God as a complaint about God. I know you're gracious, you're compassionate, you're slow to anger, full of love. You can read it in the book of Jonah. Let's not be like Jonah, okay? Nehemiah led a national revival, like a little bit like what we saw in Washington yesterday. Nehemiah said, oh God, we've been stiff-necked and stubborn, and he goes on and on. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Moses used the same words to remind God who he was, I don't, in case God forgot, or I don't know. Where did they all get this idea? What's that? <laughs> where, where did they get this idea? I, you know, the, the, the statement... Slow to anger, abounding love, gracious, compassionate, forgiving a thousand generations. Where did that come from? Well, I dug back. The first time it occurred was in Exodus 34, and it's a self-proclamation of God about his own character. Exodus 34, and God passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That's the first part of God's description of himself. For the Jews, it was God's compassion that led him to be patient and slow to anger. They, the Jewish people loved that description. They used it all the time, over and over. So he's slow to anger. Secondly, God is willing to suffer God's greatest love and patience 
was seen in his willingness to surrender his immortality, at least temporarily, to become a human named Jesus. He left the perfection of heaven to put on skin and to enter into a suffering world both to experience suffering and to alleviate it. God is patient with us, at least in part because he gets what it's like. In Ephesians 4, the author of, or not Ephesians, in Hebrews 4, the author says, for he has been tempted in every way as we have, and the result is he can empathize with us in our weakness. Paul tells us he was in very nature God in Philippians. So imagine for a minute, just imagine God being washed as a baby, dressed as a baby, carried around in his mother's shawl, carried around on his father's shoulders, carried around on his brother's backs and dropped countless times, no doubt. Imagine God as a child taking out the trash, feeding the animals, doing his chores, taking orders from his parents. Imagine God as a man working a regular blue collar construction job for 15 years, building doors and tables, living a normal, otherwise unimpressive life. Imagine God as a small group leader running Bible studies with average people, going to potlucks, trying to get people to love each other, trying to get people to forgive each other. He's so patient. Imagine him performing countless miracles and still being unable to convince most people he was God in the flesh. God in the flesh walked the earth for three years doing all this stuff. He leaves, he goes to heaven, and what's left? 120 people. That's how many chairs we have right there. That's what's left after God in the flesh walks the earth for three years. He's so patient. Imagine him tied up, nailed up on a cross, forgiving the Roman police as they tortured him. Father, forgive them. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know what they're doing. He's so patient. And we're so not patient. <laughs> the patient God is slow to anger. He's willing to suffer. And the purpose of it all the purpose of his patience is salvation. The Apostle Peter wrote two letters to the church. In his second letter, he warned the church things were going to get bad, like really bad, okay? The world was going to become increasingly secular. People were going to mock and tease them as Christians for waiting on God. Peter then said this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. It feels that way sometimes, right? Well, it's true. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and everything done in it will be laid bare. There will be a day of judgment. Make no mistake about it. James says we are to be patient, to have courage as we wait, because God is patient as he waits too. Verse 11, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Verse 14, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means 
salvation. The reason for God's perceived slowness is salvation. He's patient because he doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. God isn't slow or unable to do something about the mess the world is in right now. He's not unsure of what to do. Like, oh man, I didn't expect it to go like, he's not like that. He's actively working with the best time scale that will result in the best results. Okay, so here's an example of that. This is from John chapter 11. One day, Jesus is at work. He's just doing his thing. He's leading Bible studies. He's healing people. And he gets a text. He gets a message. He gets a message that his friend is sick. Consider Jesus' response when he gets this text message. John 11, verse 6. So when Jesus heard that his friend Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Two more days before going to see his friend. What? Isn't that the definition of slowness? Not only slow, it seems, it actually seems mean. Because other people came to Jesus and total strangers came to Jesus and they're like, my, my servant's daughter is sick or something. Will you heal them? And Jesus was like, yeah, go home. She'll be well when you get there. And it would happen. In this case, Jesus doesn't do any of that. What is the plan here, Jesus? You ever felt that way? Honestly, have you ever felt that way? What's your plan, God? Do you not see what's happening here? You know we can be that honest with God. He can handle it. Well, as some of you know, Jesus returns two days later and he resurrects a dead, a very, very dead, a four-day dead Lazarus back to life. Possibly Jesus' greatest miracle ever comes after a frustrating, disappointing time of waiting for his followers. Can you trust God with his patience? He's not slow to act. He's slow to anger. He's willing to suffer, and his purpose in all of it is to save. It's his mercy, it's his compassion that makes God patient, and it's the same mercy and compassion that can make us slow down, which we all would benefit from doing. I know I would. <laughs> it's mercy and compassion that makes us slow to anger, slow to judge, slow to speak, slow to post, slow to reply in that email the way you were almost going to send it. It's the mercy and compassion of God that makes us patient. I'm going to close with one more passage from the letter of Romans. Romans written by Paul to describe Jesus as the only hope of the world. Paul describes the state of the world in Romans 1, which is a complete disaster. He describes how terrible people are living. And then he says this in chapter 2, Romans chapter 2. You, therefore, have no excuse you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human, pass judgment on them and do the same things, do you think you'll escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, which actually means tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? This is where it has to hit home with us. What will you do with this patient God, the God who's been slow to anger with you? 
The God who's been willing to suffer for you and with you. The God who patiently waited for you to listen to him. He waited for you to repent. He waited for you to turn and come like the prodigal son or daughter to come home. What will you do with this God who's been patient with you, who saved you from a completely and chronically screwed up life? How will you respond to his patience? How will you spend, here's a way I've been thinking about it. How will you spend the grace God's given you? Impatience demands judgment. Someone has to pay. Patience offers grace. God has paid for it. I can let it go. I don't have to carry that. Impatience leads to rejection and separation. Patience leads to repentance, reunion, gathering what was separated. You know, the enemy wants to use COVID and all the current cultural upheaval to separate us. And it's only God's patience that will enable us to stay strong, to stay, not only to stay together as a family of grace covenant, but to have patience enough to gather more people into the family. Impatience acts out of anger, but patience acts out of love. Is there someone, is there anyone you could be more patient with? Is there anyone that God wants to show his patience to through you? Are there types of people, groups of people who God might want to show his patience to through you? I'm sure there is, there always is. <laughs> I wanna sing this song um, good, good father again. And I just want to encourage you to invite God to, to speak to you about this, to put names in, in front of you, faces in front of you, but even more importantly, to reveal how patient he's been with you. And then I'll close us here in a minute. You're a good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am Oh
take your hands out, maybe like this. Ask God with me to fill you again. At home, you can do the same thing or wherever you are. Just hold your hands out. God, you are perfect in all of your ways. And we ask you, God, to fill us today with a greater awareness of your great patience, your kindness, your love, mercy, and compassion towards us. And we pray, God, that you would give us that revelation so we could be generous giving that away to other people. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, we're going to have a time of prayer up front for anybody who wants prayer for any reason. We have a ministry team, at least here and here. Come forward for prayer. Otherwise, God bless you. We love you all. See you later. Have a good rest of your week.